So uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, tell you a little bit about the research uh, that, that uh, my students are doing uh, in, on high frequency power converters. So, uh, and pretty much a lot of the, what I'm going to talk about is called, it's about power density. Power density is the name of the trade here. Power density is like uh, people want smaller and smaller power supplies. Like everyone complains that they're, like it doesn't matter how small your power converter is and that it's connected to your laptop, you always want something smaller. Uh, you can see whether it's a ThinkPad or, or an iPad, like that we want smaller and smaller power converters and at some point you're gonna want them even smaller. And there's a, uh, so these are the, the, the ones that like both Lenovo and Apple sells right now. Uh, but there's a uh, small companies that uh, have released even smaller, more powerful products recently. So this is uh, uh, these two were both uh, recently uh, released. This is Finsix and this is Salt. That uh, they have released uh, 65 watts uh, converters that you can use to uh, power your laptop and also like perhaps charging your phone. Uh, with, with something that is significantly smaller than the similar offerings in, uh, in, in this kind of like power levels. But still we want smaller. Um, so one of the things I want to uh, break your bubble <laughs> is that like I've, several times people have asked me like, so if we can keep making the power converter smaller and smaller, can at some point put it inside your com laptop so you don't have a power converter? The answer is no, you can't. And that has more, much to do for safety, as if you were to put that converter inside your laptop, you would need to have wires that ha are carrying 120 volts uh, very close to your legs, and probably people won't be very, very, feel very comfortable about that. So, so, so now usually we need to put them a little far away. But it has nothing to do with the technology, it has to do with safety. But anyway, but power density is the name of the game. And uh, unfortunately, it's something that is uh, um, very actually hard to specify because it depends heavily, very heavily on applications. So here I show two uh, completely different examples of what are considered up to a few years ago state of the art in power density. So here, um, this is an a AC motor that has an extraordinarily high power density of 75 kilowatts per liter. Uh, and a similar, uh, and a power factor correction three phase for this completely different application that the most we can do is about 10, 10 kilowatts per liter. And like how much you can do for a given, uh, in power, uh, achieving power density to convert electric power from one form to another really depends on application. And it may be like, uh, straightforward to think like oh, is something easy to get? It turns out it is not. Uh, it's not a simply uh, as simply as saying like oh we need this much. We have we're processing this many watts in a certain am amount of volume because unfortunately this is something that is victim of marketing. So for example, this is a couple of power supplies uh, that um, that are commercially available. You can you go online and buy them. So this is one from General Electric that uh, has a power density of around uh, 18 watts per cubic inch. And it's pretty standard. This is like for power servers and uh, uh, like uh, it's a universal converter. Not very exciting. You see that it consists of a printed circuit board and a bunch of com components on top. Uh, similarly, like if you're willing to pay a lot more money, you, you get uh, also from GE, this is slightly more efficient uh, converter uh, that can achieve a quite respectable 24 watts per cubic inch. To give you uh, kind of an, uh, uh, an example of the power density of this converter, this is about 32 watts per cubic inch. So, uh, but I mean, it's definitely more expensive and like uh, they're rated for different environments. It's really hard to compare when, when we stand in power density. So uh, some companies built this CDC converter that had like extra, like just compare the order. Like this is 1.3 kilowatts per cubic inch. It's a power converter that like this company Bicor makes. Uh, the, what it makes it hard to, co to, to compare against is like this only does this CDC conversion. Uh, and it's, uh, in order to make this regulated, 
you probably need to add a lot of more blocks and probably some other capacitors that when you take everything into account, this number probably is gonna come down quite a lot. But I mean, for marketing purposes, this is a great number. And like, uh, kind of a, to show how it's a victim of marketing, the same company, bike or probably different team, design another circuit that only achieves seven watts per cubic inch, right? So uh, I think this guy should talk to these guys. <laughs> like, uh, but, but I'm not saying this is good or bad. It's just that like, it's something that we all want power density. It's just that uh, we don't know what that means. It's a very nebulous number. So, um, and I'm just gonna give you that. I'm not gonna make it more concrete. It's gonna be still a nebulous number, but I'm just emphasizing the fact that we just want power density. It's easier to transport, to move, to have portable applications if we have power converters that are smaller and use less amount of volume or material. So, uh, so how can we improve that 10 years number? So the, the trick in what we do in, in research for power electronics, uh, you can either go having better materials that I don't do, that's the job for the people that does material science, to make more efficient, lighter components, or what we can do from a circuit perspective that is kind of like my area of expertise is uh, increase switching frequency. So all these converters, like any power adapter that you open up, you'll see that it consists of a very limited number of ingredients. You have usually a printed circuit board, you have inductors, you have capacitors, some semiconductors and heat sinks. That's pretty much about it. And it turns out that uh, the semiconductors, we use them mostly as switches. Uh, we turn them on and off as if it was like mechanical switches, but we do it very, very fast. And it turns out that the size of all the other components, uh, inductors and capacitors, actually the size and the amount of energy they need to store varies inversely with the switching frequency, which means that at least uh, in a very, very simple way, if you were to operate the switches uh, in this converter 10 times faster, at least nominally, you would be able to reduce the size of the inductors and capacitors by a factor of 10. So that's pretty much the recipe of what we need to do to increase the power density, is just use the switches and switch them on and off as freaking fast as you can. But you can imagine that that may have some issues just because uh, things are not necessarily ideal. So particularly the semiconductors, the switches that we're trying to turn on and off as fast as we possibly can are not ideal. It takes times for them to turn on and off. And during the time, that transition time, you generate some loss that uh, prevents you from achieving high efficiency. But we can improve this by having better semiconductors. Like recently, and I'm gonna show you a couple of slides on that, there's been very new uh, semiconductors, uh, it's called wide band gap semiconductors, like silicon carbide and gallium nitride, that allows us to operate um, several times faster than like what you probably can uh, you'd, uh, find now in today's, in many converters today. Uh, another issue that is very hard to improve upon is better heat sinks. It's very difficult to extract heat from a small, small uh, components. So this is one of the disadvantage of uh, trying to, when people want things smaller and smaller and smaller. In order to be able to achieve uh, smaller, higher power densities, we also have to operate with higher efficiency. Because as things become smaller, we reduce the surface area that we can extract heat off. And at some point, things just either have to operate at much higher temperature or we need to operate uh, much more efficiently. So to show you like kind of like where the st state of the art is and where things are heading, uh, I wanna show you these uh, uh, converters that uh, uh, Professor Kollar in uh, ETH published a, a couple of years ago, several years ago already, that shows how the power density improves as we increase the switching frequency in, in converters. So for example, in this converter, all of them have the same kind of like metrics. Uh, so the, this converter has switches operating at 72 kilohertz and uh, chips a density of around four and a half kilowatts per liter. So you can see that as I showed you before that as you increase the switching frequency, we can reduce 
and we can improve the power density and reduce the size of the converter. So if you go to 250 kilohertz, you see that now we have a 10 kilowatts per liter uh, power density, which is kind of great. So let's just keep going. So if we double the frequency to 500 kilohertz, you can see that the power density now goes to 13 kilowatts per liter. But notice that we're, something is happening when, as we keep increasing the frequency. Because the devices are not ideal, what's happening is like the benefit that we're getting by switching at higher and higher frequencies is not keeping up, right? So we went, we doubled the frequency, but we didn't double the power density. Right? So if we do this again, if we go from 500 kilohertz, double the frequency again to one megahertz of switching frequency, you notice that the power density only goes to 14 kilowatts per liter. Right? So it kind of makes it questionable that like, if we double the power density, the, the switching frequency again, whether the power density will improve in any meaningful way. And it turns out that that's kind of where things are. Right, so uh, all these all these converters use uh, silicon uh, semiconductors, but by switching to a better, newer semiconductors like a wide band gap devices, it turns out that you can do much better. But it's been predicted that uh, as uh, the power density that is expected, that different converters are going to be going to achieve uh, as we progress in time. You can see that because of the non-idealities of the semiconductors and the inductors and the capacitors, there's going to be a plateau in power density that essentially is going to put a limit to how small we can make uh, power converts. Think of this as like Moore's law for power converts. Right? So, but fortunately, there's been a lot of investment in semiconductors and uh, the original uh, power converters that we all know and love use silicon devices. But there's not new, newer wide band gap material like silicon car carbide and gallium nitride that has a much larger band gap, which means that uh, they can operate much faster and also uh, have, uh, in the case of silicon carbide, much better thermal conductivity, which means that you can extract heat uh, much, more, much more effectively. So uh, having a wider energy, uh, a wider band gap means that you can make power, uh, device, semiconductor devices that can operate at higher voltages and operate at higher temperatures uh, by having uh, higher uh, electron saturation velocity. These devices, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, can operate at much higher frequencies. And also, in case of the particularly of silicon carbide, you can actually uh, cool them much better. So these are the two available uh, wide band gap devices that, that we are starting to see commercially. But I mean, the, the, I, I guess the, the holy grail of wide band gap semiconductor uh, is the development of diamond semiconductors. So diamond semiconductors, uh, they're still not commercial devices that I am aware of, but like they really, outshine all the other uh, uh, wide band gap devices that are available. It's just unclear when, hopefully in, within my career, I'll be able to see some of these uh, uh, devices. They should be able to operate at higher frequencies. You can cool them much, much better and operate them at much higher voltages, and they're going to be pretty darn expensive, but uh, hopefully. But that's not what I do. This is. Uh, uh, I guess this is a, a, the same data is represented in a different way in which you, you can see what most of the converters that have been available uh, in power electronics that use silicon devices and where gallium nitride and silicon carbide um, compare against those devices in terms of the switching frequency that they can operate at, the temperature and the voltage that they can operate at. So, the advent of, of wide band gap semiconductors really promises a lot of benefits in power electronics, but that's unfortunately not enough. It turns out that uh, uh, in, in power electronics, having better semiconductors is, is not sufficient to have smaller power converters. It turns out that uh, what, what, when you see the roadmaps for companies in the utilization of silicon carbide and gallium nitride, they tend to put 
uh, these devices replacing applications of, that you can currently have with uh, silicon devices. So for example, this is a plot that I think is uh, from, from Panasonic that shows um, in, on the horizontal axis the switching frequency, the operating switching frequency, and in the vertical, uh, vertical axis the amount of uh, instantaneous, the, the switching power that these devices can achieve. And like they have different types of se power semiconductors. And then on top of it, they, they show the areas in which they can find, the, this new gallium nitride and silicon carbide will find application. But notice that they're essentially just uh, re replacing uh, silicon devices with, at the same operating frequencies, just with a different device. And that's not enough to make the, the converter significantly better. This is a, a, another, uh, another roadmap that, that you can find online that shows the frequency space in which silicon devices uh, can operate at. So you can operate them at a few hundreds of kilohertz and uh, have power levels in the few hundreds of kilowatts. And like if you start using silicon carbide devices, you can significantly extend the power handling capabilities of your power converters, mostly because these silicon carbide devices can operate at much higher voltages. And similarly, gallium nitride devices are targeted for applications that should be able to operate at much higher frequencies because uh, uh, they have higher mobility than silicon. And uh, so you, we're expecting to see that like in lower voltages but higher frequencies whenever you need applications like that, you can start thinking about using gallium nitride devices. But still, these are very small increments of what you can actually achieve by implementing clever circuit techniques, which is what my, my, my research group is doing. Particularly, what I think it has to happen in order to improve the power density is actually cramp up the frequency a lot more. Not a tiny bit more, but a lot more. And I'll explain why is that. As I mentioned, one of the components that a lot of the power converters require is inductors. And if you remember your first uh, uh, electrical engineering classes and circuit classes when look at inductors, an inductor is usually a magnetic material, a magnetic core in which you wind a couple of, w of wires around it. And uh, that's how you make an inductor. And Unfortunately, the magnetic material uh, incur in very large losses as you try to increase the switching frequency. And that's shown in this green curve here. As we uh, increase the switching frequency of power converter nowadays from few tens of kilohertz to several uh, hundreds of kilohertz, uh, we, we see that like on this axis, I'm showing the power density of a converter. We can, as I mentioned, as we increase the power density, the, the switching frequency, we also increase the, switching, the, the power density of, of a power electronics converter. But as I mentioned, as I showed you those examples before, when we reach a frequency of few hundreds of kilohertz, probably up to a megahertz, we see that like we, we reach a point of diminishing returns in which we're not increasing the power density anymore. Mostly because we have switching losses in the semiconductor, but most importantly, it's the magnetic, the losses in the magnetic components that are getting just way too hot that, uh, that prevents us from switching even faster. So like the solution that people do not nowadays is uh, when your magnetic core gets too hot, you just get a bigger one. If you get a bigger magnetic core, that means that you cannot make the power supply <laughs> And smaller, and you find yourself in this curve that as you keep increasing switching frequency, you're not improving your power density any longer. But what my group has been proposing for, for a couple of years now is that once you read a switching frequency of few, me few megahertz, it turns out that because it's fundamental that the size of the inductors that you need becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, it turns out that once you reach this frequency, you can actually start making inductors that have no magnetic core at all. Essentially, you can use a piece of wire, make a couple of turns with it, and that's your inductor. You completely eliminate the magnetic material. But when you do that, you're gonna be penalizing power density because now you don't have a magnetic core. There's a reason people want magnetic cores, right? 
but because it still holds true that as you keep increasing the switching frequency, the size of inductors become smaller. It turns out that you can actually just, if you crank up the switching frequency about an order of magnitude or more, you can actually come back uh, when you're operating in a few tens of megahertz, you can actually gain back all the power density that you, you uh, lost by eliminating the magnetic core. But this also opens the door for new applications, and I'm going to try to show what we can do with that. So I mentioned that like one of the issues, uh, one of the reasons uh, converters generally do not operate at very high frequency is switching loss. So this is a particular topology in power converters. And, and here on the right, I'm plotting the voltage and current across this MOSFET that, as I said before, I'm operating as a switch. I'm turning it on and off so the current has a certain value or zero most of the time. But as I say that unfortunately, there is an overlap because the, 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 the MOSFET is not an ideal device. It takes some finite time to turn on and off. This results in an overlap of voltage and current across the switch that results in uh, instantaneous energy loss that, in, uh, that like translates into power loss. In, in switching power loss in your device. So uh, this pink area here is this overlap of voltage and current that when you get the average, that's the, the, the average power loss in your device that results in heating in your de device and loss of efficiency. But notice because this happens every time you turn on and off this MOSFET, if you double the frequency, this loss component will happen twice as often. And hence, you just keep increasing your switching loss. So, what my, my, my research group does is we're investigating other type of switching strategies that try to eliminate this overlap. And we can do that by being clever about how we design circuits. So uh, what we do is we use resonant switching topologies, which, which that means we have topologies that use a lot of inductors and capacitors. We love inductors and capacitors. And very complicated differ, uh, differential equations that you can solve in ways that you can set the voltage across the switch that it naturally, on its own, rings very smoothly up and down such that at the time you have to turn the switch on, you avoid having any overlap of voltage and current uh, when, when you have to turn the switch on. This type of topologies completely eliminate the switching loss that many semiconductors uh, 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 percent, but it comes at the expense of higher stresses in your semiconductor. You probably need semiconductors that requires higher voltages that have to be able to withstand higher voltages. But that's okay because now we have silicon carbide and gallium nitride devices that, that we can take advantage of. So uh, particularly in my, in my group, we, we've been working with topologies that by increasing the complexity of the uh, the, the order, the dynamic order of the circuit, we can actually achieve the same, but having much lower device stresses, which means that we can have much smaller uh, semiconductors that, uh, uh, that withstand lower voltages, which tend to be better. And uh, so this is kind of like what we're doing from a topology perspective. From a component perspective, I mentioned that like a lot of the work that we do is uh, operating at frequencies that allows us to eliminate the magnetic core. That's important because, uh, so for example, this is one of the inductors for one of the converters that I uh, built when I was uh, in grad school. And essentially, it's just a piece of plastic in which we just wind a wire around it to make an inductor. And uh, it turns out that that's an effective way to make inductors at these frequencies because it's very light. But like now there is no magnetic component, so which means that uh, you don't suffer from the temperature limitations of inductors that the inductor suffers nowadays, which means that you can operate this converter at much higher temperatures. And that also offers op opportunities for, 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 for newer applications. But by being clever about how we make these air core inductors, we can actually uh, play with the geometry and instead of forming a solenoid, we can instead uh, wind our inductor around a toroid to actually constrain the magnetic field to be within the torus to prevent having issues with electromagnetic interference. But uh, we 
take this even higher because like now uh, we're implementing inductors that do not have magnetic material, which means that the only thing that we need is actually a, a, a printed circuit board and we can implement the same uh, components just by simple traces on, the printer circuit, on a printed circuit board. So essentially what we're trying to do is instead of having a converter in which you have to put on top of it inductors and capacitors, we can simply just print traces on your printed circuit board and make a power converter out of. And there's really nice opportunities of applications that we can do. So for example, this is a, a converter that I built like 10 years ago already. And, and these are a couple of converters that like my students have recently built and like they're moving us closer to, es to essentially have the ability to essentially print a converter. So you just uh, send a converter uh, to a PCB board manufacturer and like they essentially make all your inductors and your capacitors uh, as part of the printing process that you just automatically become your power converter. And essentially what we're trying to do is uh, be able to make our inductors, transformers, and capacitors to be essentially simple traces on a printed circuit board that are actually located in the inner layers of a board such that uh, we, can, we can let the top and bottom layers to be full ground planes that will serve as Faraday shields and heat sinks such that essentially we eliminate all the physical components that you really need today to make a power convert. So, uh, in order to show you an example of this, this is a converter that uh, my students put together about a year ago that uh, essentially shows a converter that operates, uh, that delivers 320 watts. And it's nothing more than traces on a PCB that uh, it only has two, uh, two capacitors, an input and output capacitor that are actually physical devices, and uh, a gallium nitride semiconductor and a silicon carbide diode. And the rest of the components are simple uh, traces. And this converter operates effect, uh, very efficiently. Uh, it's uh, very lightweight and, uh, and hopefully it'll be very cheap because you don't have many components, right? So and how can we use these devices? And this is like uh, one area that my students and I are very excited about because like, we, we, we think that there's a very cool applications opportunities. Particularly, uh, I mentioned, I show you some examples of power converters that you can buy commercially that have achieved extraordinarily high power densities. So for example, this, is, this converter achieves a power density of around 2.7 kilowatts per, per cubic inch, very high efficiencies. And, uh, and it, when it takes the voltage from a relatively high input voltage, 400 volts, down to 50 volts. It turns out that like my, my my peers having very effective and designing power converters that bring voltage down very effectively, very efficiently and in small volumes. We have converters efficiencies that are in the upper 90s and very externally high power densities. But when we go on the other side of the spectrum, when we want to look into applications that take voltages from a low voltage to a higher voltage, it turns out that we haven't done that well. So let me show you a commercial high voltage power supply, the type of high voltage power supply that you use in scientific equipment, X-rays on satellites. And when you look at uh, converters that go, in this case, for example, from 30 volts to two kilovolts in, in voltage conversion, you find that the power density that, you, that is achieved commercially is only in the single digits of watts per cubic inch, right? That's kind of pathetic if you think about that the, when we go down in voltage, the power density is in the kilowatts per cubic inch. When we go up in voltage, the power density is in the single digits. And the efficiencies is in the 60s. So a lot of the work that my students and I have been doing is try to see why this is the case and how we can improve upon it. So what we found is that like many of the topologies that are regularly used for high voltage conversion are based on ancient circuits that are like we're exploring the like 30s and the Walton Cockcroft multiplier, for example, that has s s uh, limits in the number of stages that you can put together and limits how much voltage gain you can achieve 
So as part of my, my, my students' work, we went exploring different ways to achieve high voltage conversion very, effect, very efficiently uh, to try to see uh, uh, and apply it to new applications. So like a lot of the converts that we built consist of, have these three different stages. They consist of an inverter that takes a DC input voltage and convert it into an uh, AC signal usually at very high frequencies. We have a rectifier that takes an AC signal and brings it down to DC of a different level. And usually, uh, this rectifier and inverter, they don't like to, to, to uh, operate with the same uh, load. So you need some sort of transformation in stage that lets them talk and operate nicely. So uh, when, when you look into a, how one of the circuits look like, uh, we presented uh, this converter uh, a, a, a couple of years ago that takes 40 volts as an input voltage and delivers 500 volts at a high frequency very, very effectively. And uh, this is the DC to RF section that takes DC to, to a, a high frequency AC. And this is the rectifier that I'm going to zoom, on, zoom in a little bit. So, Right now, when, when you think about high voltage uh, conversion, usually people tend to, to refer to uh, transformers. Like you just look outside and you see a transformer that like uh, it's connected from a power plant that takes a relatively low voltages and you, by using the turn ratio of the transformer, you can achieve very high voltages uh, for, for transmission purposes. But, uh, that is very effective at low frequencies, 60 hertz in, in utility case. But when you operate at very high frequencies, it turns out that making transformers is very lossy, it's very complicated. So what we're trying to do is avoid that altogether. It turns out that when we're operating at high enough frequencies, we can, uh, uh, we can actually achieve the isolation that, you, that a, a transformer uh, lets you have by actually simply using capacitors. This is a trick that you can do at any frequency. It's just that at lower frequencies, the capacitors that you need for this to be effective tend to be huge. It's only when you ach achieve switching frequencies in the tens of megahertz that these capacitors start becoming manageable. And like, the nice thing about this is that like, by using capacitive isolation, what we can do is be able to connect the output of many, many converters, uh, as many as we want. We can cascade them at the output while the input are connected in parallel to achieve much larger level of conversions that you can do using transformers. So let me show you an example. So this is a converter that one of my students presented a, 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 a early last year that takes 40 volts input and delivers two kilowatts and cascades the output of 12 converters uh, that are capacitively isolated in the way I show you. What this allows us to, to do is we, we achieve a large conversion ratio from 40 volts to uh, two kilovolts at, uh, in a very small volu volume. This is something about JBIG and actually quite efficiently. This achieves uh, uh, an efficiency of around 92% uh, when we're talking about DCDC for 100 watts output. But what, what is extraordinary about this type of uh, converter is how fast it is. So because of the switching frequency, we can actually, so, so here uh, uh, I'm showing the output of this converter. So the, here the converter is off, right? And then we just like turn it on and we reach two kilovolts and we reach two kilovolts within a couple of microseconds. So we can go from zero to two kV in about a microsecond, give or take. And then we can keep the converter on for as long as we want and we can turn it off. And this is something that because of the switching frequency, we can do with this type of converters, but if you were to buy any high voltage converter, you probably wouldn't be able to do. And why would we, why would we want to do that? And this is a very interesting application that we've been exploring thanks to the uh, Tomcat Center for Sus Sustainability that supported us on this work. Like imagine that you have a stainless steel pipe, right? And then you put a gap in, in, in it to form electrodes. And then this is just to insulate the, 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 
the, these two parts. Then imagine that you have water flowing through this, this uh, pipe, but that water contains bacteria. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply those very sharp voltages that we are applying across our, uh, by, by using our converter. Because when you apply very high voltages across bacteria, bacteria tend to die. Essentially, what we're, we're trying to do is we, we apply an electric field that reaches between 20 to 50 kV per centimeters. And like when you do that, like the bacteria explode. And it turns out that this is a very effective way to achieve pasteurization without having to heat a liquid. So right now, when you think of pasteurization, would you, you imagine like heating a liquid very quickly to a high temperature and then to cool it down to, uh, to try to save, uh, uh, to not alter the flavor of things very much. But it turns out that uh, this is actually more effective. Uh, this is a process that is non-thermal. So you can kill bacteria without increasing the temperature of the liquid. So in theory, it shouldn't change the flavor of the things you pasteurize much. It's more effective, like uh, when you use thermal pasteurization, you tend to kill the bacteria as a, uh, as a side effect. So the energy that you're putting in the liquid is such that like you're starting to disturb the, the biology of the cells. Here, you're directly applying the, 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 uh, the pulses, the, these high voltage pulses across the bacteria and then you just blast them away. And uh, this has been proved effective for pasteurization of food stuff, but also for uh, extraction of oil in algae and, uh, and also for wastewater treatment. And I wish I had come up with this. This is uh, something that uh, uh, has been explored uh, for several years now. And there's a, company, uh, there's a company in the East Coast called Diversified Technologies that makes this system commercially to treat water in this way. But well, this is the smallest thing that they sell. So this is a unit that cost about $200,000. This is the lab unit. And, uh, and it's used to uh, pulse electric field treat uh, liquids and food stuff. So what my, my students wanted to explore, if we, see, we can take advantage of the high frequency circuits that we build to build smaller systems and find really cool applications for it. So we built a tiny version for this system. Essentially, we built a converter. We, we thought about making something about the size of a Breda filter that you can connect to your tap. And as water passes through, we have a couple of electrodes that are separated a couple of millimeters. And we can apply the output of our converter and these very fast pulses to kill bacteria as the water passes through. And it turns out that it works really well. So we actually got a, a, a fish tank in my lab and we let it like, like uh, get a little green. And then when we take a sample, we can culture the bacteria to see the amount of uh, E. coli and coliform that we, we are able to, that, that this water has. And then we pass this liquid through our electrode system and it just like kills the bacteria away. It doesn't change the color by the way, it still looks green. So no, I won't drink it. <laughs> but, but like it achieves very significant uh, uh, reduction in bacterial levels, and uh, essentially render the, bac the, the bacteria inert. So, uh, and it requires a, very, a small amount of energy. So, uh, thanks to the, uh, with the support of the Tomcat uh, Center for Sustainability, my students were actually wanted to take this idea even further, because even though we like the idea of being able to use uh, circuits to to clean water, to pasteurize water. Uh, we, we realize that there's a lot of competition in that market, right? You can imagine that, for example, you can use UV light to clean water. You go to REI and buy one of these filters, uh, UV lamps to clean water when you go camping. Or you can just use reverse osmosis. Or even something cheaper, just add a couple of drops of chlorine. And that's it, right? So like, we, we realize that like, probably water none, was not the best market for this kind of stuff. So we were looking for other markets and like what the students realized thanks uh, with, with some collaboration with the, with, the, with the business school, it turns out to be milk, right? It turns out that about 40% of the milk that is produced in rural places gets spoiled before, uh, before it reaches a distribution channel. So you can imagine that like 
some guy has a cow, it milks his cow or her cow. Uh, and uh, then it takes the milk to the village nearby. And because of temperature, weather conditions, road conditions, uh, there's a high probability that some of that uh, milk gets spoiled, about 40% of it. And it just has to be thrown away, right? So we thought maybe it's possible to actually build something the size of a Breda filter that is sitting next to the cow. To, uh, uh, to essentially like pasteurize on site the milk such that to, to, uh, to, to reduce the bacteria content in the milk enough such that the farmer has longer time to take their product into market. So we thought it was the greatest idea ever, but then we realized that physics intervened. So it turns out that uh, milk is about 300 times more electric conductive than water. So that means that our tiny little converter that we built which is not juicy enough to, to treat the water. So we have to actually scale our design up. So we had to build a, a different circuit that is able, to, to, uh, is able to, to, to give two kilowatts of instantaneous electric power at the same two kilovolts level uh, in a relatively small fraction, in, in, a, in a small volume. So uh, just to show you how fast we can uh, achieve the two kilovolt level, when we turn on the converter, we, we achieve two kilowatts within three microseconds, right? And uh, this is important because we're applying the electric power directly across the liquid. And I don't know if your mom told you not to do that. <laughs> if you do it for too long, you just vaporize the liquid. And uh, so. If you want to use this technique, you just have to apply pulses that are only a few microseconds long, such to avoid heating the liquid. So you're going to kill bacteria but by, <laughs> by burning everything around. So we built this two kilowatt system that, in a way that is effective uh, for treating milk, uh, milk pasteurization. And, uh, and that's kind of what we're being testing. So uh, this is the converter that we're building. And it turns out that you can actually uh, buy raw milk in the farmer's market sometimes. So we, we put a little pump and then we just like treat the, the milk. Uh, we apply a couple of pulses and we send it for testing to, uh, uh, and we demonstrated like a, 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 with, with only a couple of pulses, we can reduce the, the bacteria content by log three. Uh, it's still not enough for human consumption, but it's just testing what we can do with this. But like the temperature doesn't increase significantly uh, at all in this time converter. Okay, so, um, and lastly, the other work that I wanted to show you that we, my students have been working on is on uh, satellite power supplies. Uh, you are familiar with these gigantic uh, satellites that cost billions of dollars. It turns out that there's a lot of like uh, companies that are starting to explore what you can do with smaller, smaller uh, satellites. So uh, this is what you can do with big satellites, but this is what you can do with small satellites. Small satellite, you can actually see wider like, areas of the Earth, not with high resolution, but with enough to monitor uh, uh, disaster, natural uh, 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 movements, etc. But one of the problems of using small satellites is that right now there's not enough space in the satellite to add propulsion, which means that once you put your satellite in space, it just like falls back in after a few months. So there's a lot of interest to try to be able to maintain those uh, satellites in orbit. And also like sometimes when you release a small, a small satellite, they are, uh, it's usually a secondary load in a bigger satellite. So usually the, the rocket provider dumps your satellite somewhere which is not precisely the place you want it or at the orbit that you want it to be at. So there's a lot of interest to be able to, uh, to have uh, correct the orbits or change the orbits that you're operating at. So uh, you guys probably familiar have heard about like ion, ion thrusters that are used in, like, uh, the, in the satellites that are exploring the solar systems. But again, these are systems that are gigantic. So some of the work that we've been uh, collaborating with Professor Capelli in mechanical engineering 
is to try to develop uh, something that is called a helicon double layer plasma thruster that allows us to have very, very efficient uh, satellite thruster in a very small fraction of the volume. So uh, in order to do that, and we supported the Precord Institute, we actually, we've been evaluating uh, using 3D, printer, 3D printing technologies to develop tiny, very lightweight uh, air core inductors that we can use to build these CubeSat satellite thrusters. So, uh, and this is an example of one of these thrusters. So this is a, a thruster for a, a CubeSat that we're developing that only weighs five grams and is able to deliver 50 watts of RF power that is capable enough to strike the helicon double layer plasma that we can use for a CubeSat. And the whole system, we expect to have a thrust in the millinewton range and a significant, uh, with a, with a, uh, and we can fit in a CubeSat. So this is, a, a, is, students get really excited when they start working on, on satellite stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. And, and just lastly, uh, we, it turned out that we became very good at making plasmas. So we've been evaluating using plasmas for medicine. So like the Max Planck Institute, for example, developed a therapy that uses plasma to kill bacteria uh, uh, on, on tissue. Uh, it turns out that bacteria cannot build resistance when you kill it using plasma. So my students put together a small converter that they can use to, essentially it's a similar converter than the one I showed you before, but, but oriented to, to building uh, atmospheric pressure plasmas. To, and so they develop a gun that is about the size, I mean, it's a quarter, and they can use it to kill bacteria uh, on, on skin. So uh, my students recently got a, a grant with the med school here to try to develop this into, into a commercial product for using plasmas uh, for medicine. And with that, thank you. Thanks very much, Juan. Uh, we have time for a couple questions, actually, for me uh, as a former aerospace guy. So I started my career there. If we had this technology, then we would have rethought everything we were doing at that point. I did flight mechanics, so really revolutionary. Any questions from the audience? This is a little bit technical, but you made it very fascinating from my, my point of view. Any questions, student questions? Electrical engineers, comm system people? Any questions? Yeah, yeah you know, I wanted to fly just way back. Oh, yeah. You had your inverter. Yeah. Uh, efficiency was greater than your rectifier. Yeah, I find that interesting. Uh, so, so one of the things that we found is that, like, when we're exploring using uh, silicon carbide devices at high frequencies, uh, it turns out that it's still an immature technology. So we did we identify a loss mechanism that is not captured in the models provided by the semiconductor companies. Yeah. So uh, the rectifiers are particularly lossy. And it's not fundamental. I think it's, it has to do with like trap charges in the wide band gap semiconductor. And that should get better over time as people understand how to do the material processing. But right now, they're bad. <laughs> Looks like we have a two-finger question, yep. five-finger question. Do you see any application of high temperature superconductors for inductors that can reduce the size and reduce some of the more? So, so like one of the areas that I've been very interested in would be for uh, borehole uh, converters, like things get really, really hot, or also for like neutron, uh, uh, neutron emissions for... for uh, Nuclear magnetic resonance. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, that's the, the last... Uh, <laughs> the last slide that I, I, I didn't was able to show yeah. is like we can make this type of converters amenable to operate in an MRI machine because they do not suffer from saturation as we don't have magnetic material. Great. Well, thanks, Ken. One, one final. Thanks.